This is Hardy Merriman. For nearly two decades, his work is focused on nonviolent civil resistant movements around the world that are fighting for democracy and human rights. He has presented and published extensively on this topic. He recently co-authored Hold the Line, A Guide to Defending Democracy, in which he applies insights from pro-democracy movements to the United States and discusses how we can protect the upcoming 2020 election. Today, he's speaking to us in his independent and personal capacity. Hardy, can you unmute yourself? Hey, everyone. Here we go. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, so nice to be here uh, with you all, at least on the screen. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so I was asked, I was told I have 15 minutes, which is great and generous, and thank you, um, to talk about a, a work that I co-authored called Hold the Line, A Guide to Defending Democracy. And it comes from my background uh, looking at movements that are against authoritarian governments and trying to figure out how do people, ordinary people, push for democracy when institutions may not be working. And so I worked with several co-authors uh, several months over the course of several months, starting in June, um, on a guide about how we can protect our election. Um, all the things that you all are doing, voting, getting out the vote, are incredibly important. So the first thing is, to protect our democracy, we have to actually participate in it as fully as possible. Another thing that we're, um, th that I am advising a lot of people to do who are not uh, at a high risk group for COVID is to consider being a poll worker as well, which is really critical because we have a shortage of poll workers. Obviously, if you are at high risk for COVID, then that's, that's not something to do. <laughs> but we want our institutions to work as well as possible despite all the challenges. Now, at the same time, um, we have a president, and again, I'm speaking my independent capacity today, who has shown that he is willing to push every boundary and that basically he doesn't constrain himself. He, he needs to be constrained in order to respect democracy. This is what it's appearing like based on his statements, past statements, past actions, and present statements about really not committing to respect the results of the election. So we have a really abnormal election this time. We have to do everything possible that we normally do to vote and participate in democracy and think about what happens afterwards. So it's like this double challenge. So what I wanted to do is share my screen. Let's see. And run through um, some <clears throat> guidelines from Hold the Line. Can people see my screen? Yep, okay, good. And this guide is available for free online. <clears throat> and it's really largely focused on what we can do to protect the election afterwards to make sure that the results are respected. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through, the first thing we do in the guide is we outline three different scenarios. And sorry folks, this is the sort of what could go bad, what could go wrong part. But there's a lot of hope because there's a lot we can do to prevent it. And there have been lots of scary examples in the media of this could go wrong, that could go wrong. And at some point, it's not helpful if they're not also giving you a sense of what you can do to try, to try to make sure that things go right. So we'll talk about what could go wrong and then I'll spend the rest of the time talking about what could go right. So the first thing, when we think about post-election, there's sort of three scenarios we mapped in the, in, the, in the guide. The first is what happens if on election night, election day night, the results are unclear and Trump declares victory anyway? Certainly not impossible, right? We know that in-person voting is, you know, that count is gonna be readily available, but mail-in ballots might take longer. We know that mail-in ballots are likely to trend towards Biden. So it is totally possible that on election night, results are unclear or there's a slight lead for Trump. He declares victory and there's all these absentees that would clearly push it towards Biden. And Trump may declare victory. What do we do then, right? The thing about it is, is that if Trump declares victory and then you start seeing ballots shift blue towards Biden, what's to prevent Trump from saying, you know what, this is very suspicious, this blue shift we're seeing. I think that we probably should investigate this or to try to get, you know, and to investigate it, let's, let's try to get a federal court injunction to try to stop ballot counting so we can figure out what's going on here. 
So he would have to get a federal court injunction to do it unless he did something truly just like really try to a power grab. But this is one scenario we have to be concerned about. Another scenario we have to be concerned about would simply be irregularities in the election afterwards. There could be a major delay in a vote count report from a particular county and then suddenly the county reports and what they report as results are really skewed, really off from what they've reported in the past. Or you could just, you could see the, you know, electronic voting machines that have changed votes, which has been documented to have happened before. There's lots of ways that you could have irregularities. You could have rumors of a cyber attack. You could have um, a blackout at a polling site, you know, and it's not clear why the blackout was caused and suddenly that polling site is closed. And then do people get to extended polling hours? There's lots of things. We know this could go wrong. <laughs> you all in Florida know things can go wrong too. Now, the question is, if that happens, is it fully investigated and is there a remedy applied, right? And what happens if there's major regularities and Trump says, okay, great, I'm gonna declare victory anyway, and we're not gonna investigate them. And then the third is sort of the most extreme, which is Trump clearly loses the election and simply says, this is a fraudulent victory for Biden, for Biden this is a fraudulent result, I'm not leaving, right? And in any of these scenarios, another risk that happens is that if people start protesting and mobilizing to try to uphold democracy, which I fully think they should do, if any of these happen, there could be counter protests, which could lead to violence. And so the risk of election violence is actually real in this election, realer in a way than it has been for quite a while in the United States. And if violence happens, um, that opens up other possibilities that are really challenging and actually probably a lot of them would benefit Trump. So it's really important now for us to think through a couple things. The first is, if we're in any of these scenarios, how do we know if it's time to act and protect democracy, right? Because if you go back like to the first scenario, there would be like a court process and there would be legal appeals and people would say, okay, our institutions are working, but at what point do we say, us ordinary citizens need to get involved, right? We saw in Florida in 2000 institutions, you know, and the, you know, lawyers and everything, and it was sort of an expert process. Is there a point where we as people should have said, we're gonna do something, we're gonna protest, we're gonna be more active in this. And to do that, we have to figure out what's the lines that if they're crossed is gonna trigger our doing something more. All of which would be strictly nonviolent, of course all of which would simply be about upholding democracy in ways that are consistent with our First Amendment rights, right? Exercising our constitutional rights. The second problem <laughs> that we have though, is if we decide it's time to act, what do we do? Protest is one option, but protest is not the only option and protest may not be safe for everyone, right? So what else can we do beyond just protest? And that's part of what we address in the guide. So, one thing that we, we talk about, we spend a whole section about is talking about how you can form a local election protection group. And you can do this in four steps. So the first step is form your group. And to form an election protection group, you don't need to, no one needs to be an expert. It doesn't need to be a big group. It can just be a few friends that you know. It can just be a few people that you know to start with. And in the hold the line guide, we walk through like, here's the agenda that you can use for your first meeting. Here's the principles that your group can commit to. We really like lay it out step by step for how to do this. And each election protection group, we advise hold, tries to hold three lines. The first line is that all votes must be counted without interference and intimidation. That means if you see that line being crossed, that's a sign for you to get involved. And those lines can even be crossed before the election by, by statements of certain public officials. You don't have to wait till after November. Third, the second line is incidents of voter fraud, voter suppression, or other election irregularities must be both investigated and remedied as appropriate. Again, if you see that crossed or even politicians or public officials starting to move towards that line, that's a sign to mobilize. You don't have to wait. And the third is that the results must be respected, right? And so when Trump says, I may not respect the results, that's like he's already crossing a line. He's already crossing a line because 
he's talking about not respecting results based on this view that there's going to be voter fraud that is consistently defied by the experts. If he had a claim that, no, no, there's really like a risk here and experts were like, he's right, then maybe that wouldn't be crossing a line. But if you're just throwing out, I'm not going to respect the results because I might just think something with no evidence that there's been fraud, that's crossing a line. So you form your group you, you, and you start to ask, what would crossing the lines look like in my particular city or county? Who are my, who's my county clerk? What's our state secretary of state? Who are these people? Who administers elections at our level? And that leads you to your, to your second meeting, which is where you actually map your power holders. And we have a list here. It's a, something you can get online. Your governor, your state attorney general, your secretary of state, all the way down to your county clerk, local media, even your chief of police. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to why you put your chief of police there as well in, in a minute. And you, you identify all of them and you have people in your group watch each one and look at their statements, see if it's time to contact their office, see if it's time to start a petition to push them. Again, you don't even have to wait for November. If they're starting to come up to those lines with their actions now, you can start pushing back already. And it's really important actually to start pushing soon or early if you need to, because that show that we are organized and ready to protect the election is actually really important for creating momentum and creating a narrative that if there are attempts to subvert the results, they will be challenged immediately. We will not take a week or two to mount a response. We are ready now and we are watching. That can be an important deterrent. So you can map your power holders in your second meeting and figure out which ones have made commitments already to that, that are consistent with your views and which ones seem to not really be committed. The third step is actually plan tactics. Okay, if they cross the line, what are your tactics? And so here I've got an image of a protest, but there are many others. I loved the, um, the golf cart caravan, loved it. There are so many creative ways we can do tactics that could be safe for us um, and that can create pressure and that can get media coverage. And so we, meeting three is we actually have a whole tactic brainstorming worksheet about all the different ways you could put pressure on power holders if you need to. Step four is, sim is, is simple. You just review and prepare your plan. You update it if needed. And those are the four steps to starting an election protection group. And they're in the hold the line guide in detail. We actually have a sample agenda that you can use for each of those four meetings. We also recently put together um, a campaign plan that people can use. It's called the Commitment to Uphold Democracy. And what the Commitment to Uphold Democracy is, is it's something that we can do in October where we form a group, map power holders, and we actively go to our elected officials and demand that they uphold four commitments around Again, ensuring they use their full authority to make sure everyone can vote and every vote is counted, the results are respected, irregularities are investigated and remedied, and that they will report in a timely way on the elections process. We also, in the commitment to uphold democracy campaign, actually have commitments that we ask local law enforcement to make and also members of the National Guard if you choose to also focus on that. You, you don't have to focus on all of them, but if you choose to, because <clears throat> With the potential for or very likely protest afterwards, the question is, are police committed to protecting people's First Amendment rights and protests? We'd like them to reaffirm that. We'd like them to recommit to that. We'd like chiefs of police to re-recognize their oath to the Constitution it covers the First Amendment, which covers protest. We would also like to see them commit, again, to protect people's First Amendment rights. So it's not just that the police respect them, it's also that they recognize that if armed groups show up, and we've seen this in the country now, it's crazy that I even have to talk about this, but I do. If armed groups show up to protest in parts of the country, that the police affirm now that they see their responsibility to protect protesters from armed groups that show up. And so these are demands we can make now. And they're all consistent with the oath to the Constitution that police, government employees, and public officials take. We're simply asking them to restate it and letting them know that we are watching and that we're expecting this.
So that's, that's my presentation. I think I kept it to 14 minutes. I told Chris to get the hook if I went one second beyond 15. And here are some um, links you can use to download the Hold the Line Guide, to download the Commitment to Uphold Democracy Plan. Here's our email. If any of you people are on Twitter or Instagram, you are welcome to follow us. And thank you, thank you very much for having me. That was great, Hardy. That was, that was really, really great. Um, I took pictures of, of this screen and of the others so that we can share them. So everybody has the right information. Thank you very much. And if I can be useful, don't hesitate to email. Thanks so much. Really, that was great. When we first started talking about this, I met Hardy and Adam uh, come in. It was based off an article uh, that was sent to me, I think by Heather, called 10 Things You Need to Know to Stop a Coup. And, and it just really struck me that, you know, these are things that we should read now, that these are not left-wing crazy conspiracy theories. We really might have to fight to, uh, to make sure that our election is valid and the results are upheld. And that's a scary time to live in. Um, I'm gonna share the, uh, the article around again.